Good morning, Mulberry United Methodist Church. Good morning. Good morning, church family. Good morning to those watching on live streaming. Hello, Lord and Lori. Hello to Paul and Cindy. Hello to others that are not able to come today. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us and also as we celebrate Veterans Day. Some announcements this week. The office will be closed tomorrow in honor of Veterans Day. Church council meeting. There's a change on the date in your on the back of your bulletin. Church council meeting will be Thursday, November 14th, not the 11th, at 415 in the fellowship hall. All committee chairmen are urged to come. I want to thank everyone for signing up for food donations for the Thanksgiving dinner on November 24th. The complete list is full for your dinner. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your donations. That will be a great meal, uh, and this is sponsored by the Outreach Committee. All are welcome. Please come as we break bread together for our Thanksgiving church dinner. Next, coming up on Saturday, December 7th, is our annual Christmas Bazaar Bazaar, sponsored by the United Methodist Women and Women in Faith back in our fellowship hall from 9 to 2. To make this complete, if you would like to help, I'm looking for some more door prizes, some silent auction items, and... Um, also, oh yes, bake sale items. Do y'all like brownies and cookies and cakes and pies and all that goodies? There's a sign-up sheet in the back on the glass counter. If you would like to bring something to the bake sale, we sure appreciate it. Also, we need a few door greeters on our shifts to greet the people and hand out uh, door price tickets. There's also a sign-up sheet on the glass counter for greeters at the Christmas Bazaar. And if that's not enough on Saturday the 7th, just wait till Sunday the 8th. Our annual Christmas cantata will be here. You don't want to miss this. We're also bringing in some wonderful singers from the colonnades to join us. So this area will be completely full of musicians. The cantata service will be at 10.30 on December 8th. Please mark your calendar, 10.30 on December 8th instead of 11 o'clock. And you can always donate to the Bernice's Twice as Nice Thrift Shop. Donations are always needed and welcome. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for our service today. Pastor? One other quick announcement is Ron Connerman's service will be this sun Saturday at 4 p.m. here um, in the sanctuary. Um, so just please put that on your calendar. It is so good to be in worship with all of you, whether you are here in person or watching online. Let us come together in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we have come to you this day, bringing all that we have, our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our fears and sorrows. We place these before you in faith and hope, knowing that no matter what has happened, you are with us. Open our hearts to receive your words. Open our hearts to receive your spirit, that we may find healing and comfort. Open our lives to the wondrous possibilities for service and joy that you offer us. Ease our minds and spirits that we may hear the words of encouragement and peace this day. In your holy name, amen. amen. Stand and say, 399, your red handbook. Take my life and let it be.
please join me as we read responsibly the call to worship as found in your bulletin. What do you bring before the Lord this day? We bring our hopes and dreams to the Lord. What do you seek? We seek peace for our weary souls. You will bring it in this place, for this is the house of the Lord. Open our hearts and our spirits, O Lord, to hear your words of comfort and peace. Amen. Please remain standing for the next hymn. Isaiah, Zechariah, 
So following the condemnation of the scribes, Jesus contrasts their large donations made by those wealthy individuals to the two small coins given by a poor widow. Traditional interpretations often commend the widow, praising her selfishness that she gave all she had. She is portrayed as an ideal figure whose sacrificial gift is seen as faith and commitment. The passage invites a deeper reflection on the relationship between religious display and social practice. The story of the widow may not be solely about her self-giving, but also about the injustice she represents. It serves as a critique of the socioeconomic system and the religious authorities that fail to create care for the most vulnerable. So this passage allows readers, it can challenge them to explore the contradictions in their own lives between religious devotion and the realities of wealth, power, and exploitation. So hear these words from the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. As Jesus taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. So then Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people came in to put large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their own abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So folks, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. Amen. When we see this text, we see Jesus wanting to share with his disciples with his followers, the scribes and religious leaders, all about the kingdom of God, this upside down world, this world where a poor widow putting two small coins is worth more than the large sums of money. He gives this example of the widow because she has a higher worth of her wealth. She gave all she had. He recognized the leaders did not give all they had. They put on a show. Perhaps they gave to receive that recognition. Sometimes it feels good to be recognized. Perhaps they gave so that they can then look down to others. Oh, you gave a hundred, I gave 500. Perhaps they wanted that sense of superiority. It's important for us to be aware of why we give, why we do things. When I was looking at commentaries on this passage, I saw different commentators thinking about how this woman walked up to drop her coins. Was she humbly gathering in the shadows, trying to get the courage to drop what she had? Was she hunched over? Was she trying to be invisible? Did she feel a sense of shame that all she had was two coins? Or did she walk with her head held high because she was giving all she had? I think it's important to look at it in the different ways. Perhaps in our own life, there have been times we have felt like that version where she is trying to hide, be invisible. 
Perhaps you've given in times where your head is high. You have that sense of security, that sense of deep rooted faith that I am giving because I believe God can use this to multiply. Or perhaps when we drop what we have in the offering, perhaps it's a sense of uncertainty, a sense of shame. Many pastors and churches love to use the scripture to discuss stewardship giving, their fall capital campaign. Please give us money like the widow. God too can use your coins and multiply it. But too often, they only focus on the widow giving. They'd like to downplay the part of the scribes, of the religious leaders, of those who have wealth. Because the scribes were the one with power. They were the one with authority. They sat at the best tables. People listened to them. They had voice and agency far more than a poor widow. It's important for us to reflect on why Jesus is sharing these stories. What is he saying about the scribes? And what does that mean for us today in 2024? It's important to look at the scribes and he said that they like to have those prayers, those long robes, that sense of recognition. They believe they are more important than everyone else. They have the answers. They have the power. And Mark estimation, they seem to be kind of braggy, self-important. Perhaps you know someone like that. Perhaps you have been that person at times. We don't like to think of ourselves as the scribes as those religious leaders. But this part of Mark's gospel looks at Jesus's triumphal en entrance into Jerusalem. We see those who are poor, those on the margins, embracing Jesus, welcoming Jesus. We see the religious leaders pushing back against what Jesus had to say. There's been controversy. The religious leaders want to get Jesus to do something wrong. After all, they like their power. They like their influence. This Jesus fellow is coming and mixing things up. He's calling the religious leaders out. It's never fun when someone comes to you and lets you know that perhaps you're not doing things 100% right. Perhaps we get defensive. Perhaps we shut down. Those parts of growing in our faith are not always fun. As we look at this widow, we look at how in the ancient Near East and the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus, how it was a patriarchal world where a woman whose husband died was still considered to be a part of her husband's family. After her husband's death, her support became the obligation of her sons if she had them. And so if she was still young and had no sons, her father-in-law probably would have arranged another marriage for her. But if a woman lost her husband and was not able to remarry, she had no sons. She was put in a vulnerable, uncertain situation. She was unable to provide and protect herself. If you're familiar with parts of the Bible, you may remember that they talk about the widows. You're supposed to care and protect the poor, the orphan, the widows. We can see that in Isaiah and Jeremiah, Deuteronomy, Yet oftentimes when the prophets spoke about the widows, they did not say, religious leaders, you're doing a great job. I am so proud of you. It was often a condemnation. You need to care. 
for the ones who do not have agency, the ones who do not have voice. We see in the book of Ruth, when she came, she got to pick what was left over. That was something the orphans, the strangers, the widows did. They had a claim on the fruits and grains that fell to the ground. But it was often up to the responsibility of the king, the leaders, to care for these vulnerable groups. As we look at the vulnerable groups, we see you should not mistreat the orphan or the widow in the book of Exodus. You should heed their cry. If we look at the Midrash, which is the Jewish method of interpreting scripture that uses citations to support a passage that may be a little removed from the literal meaning, the Midrash stresses the word any to include the widow of a king and in the Jewish tradition generally concerns the feelings for the widows, feelings for the widows and orphans that apply to not just the poor widows, but to the ones who may have wealth. This could perhaps look at this text and mark a little different. How do we care for the widow? The ones who have maybe some agency, the ones we don't. The widow has decided that her money what little of it she had belonged to God. It's about perspective. It's how we look at our world. Are we looking at our world through the, our human lens? Are we looking at the world through the upside down world of the kingdom of God? If we look at it through the kingdom of God, her values may differ. Our hopes may differ. We can look at people differently. Instead of looking at those with the robes and the highest position of power, we can look who's sitting at the end of the table. The one who probably gets the least. The one who may not have a lot to give. This gospel lesson looks at the scribes as a whole. It's not calling out one specific scribe but about the culture and the values of the scribe. The religious leaders lost their way. Jesus confronts their beliefs and their values. The values that had an oppressive system. He said, beware of the scribes. If I was a religious leader, which some people call me, and I heard someone say, beware of the United Methodist pastors, My ears would perk up. My heart and spirit may be defensive. I may want to push back and say, no. I like my life the way it is. I don't want to reflect. I don't want to look at the scriptures and see that the prophets may be talking about me. No, I want to be like the widow who gives all she has. The one Jesus says, look at her in a positive way. But Jesus threatened the whole idea, the whole ideology that maintained the position of power. Again, I wonder, what would the church look like if Jesus talked to us? If Jesus said, beware of the United Methodist pastors. Beware of the United Methodist churches. Is there some truth in that? In our communion liturgy, we say we have not heard the cry of the needy. We have not listened to our neighbors. Those words are a reminder when we are like the scribes, when we too like that power. Jesus was trying to turn their values upside down. Elevate the poor, the outcast, the vulnerable. So again, what would the church look like if we reflected on that? If we preach from the perspective of the widow, the orphan, the poor. 
One commentator said perhaps the church would no longer be asked to do invocation for political rallies. And maybe powerful politicians would no longer attend our gatherings. This is the text in our lectionary. Many pastors are preaching on this after the election, wondering how do we move forward as a country that seems often divided. For some, church is a place, a sanctuary, a family of connection. So perhaps the church, if Jesus said, beware of the church, perhaps we would look at our leaders both religious, perhaps we would look at our political leaders and ask how are they caring for the poor? How are they caring for the vulnerable? That is the question for us today. It is easy to just look at this text of the widow to say, I want to be like her, to give all I have so that God can use it. It's important for us, though, to look at the text before. How are we like the scribes? What would Jesus say to us today? Would, it, would Jesus call us out? And if he did, would we listen? Would we listen to him? Or would we often be like the scribes and want to keep the power and agency we have? It can be easy to shut down the voices that challenge us, the voices that make us want to turn the volume down. There are many pastors across our country today who had wondered what would be the words to say. Some pastors were trying to find the magic words until they realize there is no service that has a, the perfect words. Because that means we're thinking of what we want to say. My words will be important. It's not giving room for the Holy Spirit to move in a mighty way. Perhaps we can get caught up in our routine of the church. We always do it this way. This is the best way because we've always done it. When we create the rules and ridges and structures, are we telling God and the Holy Spirit, you're not welcomed here? I encourage us to think about this text, how God is going to perhaps challenge us. Challenge us these next few weeks, these next few years, challenge us on our life. Because again, John Wesley believed that once we had our faith, we were continuing on. We were continuing on for that sanctific sanctification, us growing in our faith. So church, are we willing to listen to the word of God? Yes. Yes. Are we willing to listen to the word of God even if it challenges us? even if we don't like what the Spirit has to say. Uh, that one was a little more whispered, yes. Uh, which I am not, which, you know what, would probably be my answer as well. So let us pray. Gracious and holy God, sometimes we want to be like that widow, to give all we have for Jesus to say, look, Look at my child. Oftentimes, Lord, we can be like the scribes. We want it to be our way. We believe we are often right. We like our comfort, our power, our privilege. Lord, use your spirit to challenge us to let your world, your kingdom be here on earth. In your holy name, amen. As you see in our anthem, it says special patriotic <coughs> music. Sharon is going to play the music from the different military branches. So if you hear 
When you hear your branch representative, whether you served or someone in your family did, we invite you to please stand. Korean Methodist Church. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as a sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God 
as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters, we believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. service. Although the text today was not about specifically about stewardship, it is important for us to look at why we give. Perhaps we give, we tithe that 10% because it's what we read in the scriptures. It's what we were taught to do. Perhaps we give all we can. Perhaps our gifts are not financial. Perhaps we give by volunteering with the church, with the food pantry, with the thrift store. Perhaps we give with our voice and we sing in the choir. How we give. We remember we do it not for us, but for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we come before you now. We come in the time where we give with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Perhaps we give, giving all we have, whether it is two coins. We give knowing that you can multiply these gifts. After all, you can multiply fish and bread to feed more than we can imagine. Lord, use these gifts so we can glorify you, so we can transform the world by making disciples of Jesus Christ. Let these gifts be used for your glory. In your holy name, amen. Thank you. 
127 in your red hymn book. church family. I don't know if you saw when you came in, we have um, some pictures of the damage that our beloved fellowship um, center and prayer garden sustained after Hurricane Milton. This space is not just a structure, but it houses many of our missions, our thrift store, our food pantry, and it's also a venue for the community to use. And it's also something that we use personally for fellowship. Um, we have Sunday school back there. We have dinners back there. Um, there's a lot of things that we use the building for. We are beginning to assess the repairs needed and are dedicated to restoring the fellowship building to ensure that it continues to serve as a haven for all. To achieve this, we are inviting our church family to join in the conversation about how we can collectively support this restoration. If anyone would like to personally go back and see the damage after the service, I would be happy to unlock the gate for you. Our church has always been a supportive family and we know that many of you have skills, connections, or resources that could aid this effort whether it's sharing ideas for repair, helping organize events, or providing knowledge about construction, your input can make a difference. We will keep everyone updated on our progress and upcoming events. As we move forward, let's remember the power of our faith and community is overcoming obstacles. Every contribution, whether large or small, plays a part in the restoration of our cherished building. Thank you for your continued support and dedication to our mission. We truly appreciate each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. I invite, if you haven't looked at the board in the back, to take a look at the photos. As we come to this time of joys and concerns, we have some praises. One is Ward Hurst. He is making progress, slow progress, um, but he is in currently in rehab. Uh, another is uh, for Paul Morgan, 
It says Paul has done okay the last few days. He is eating well, again, making little progress. Lauren Messer is home from the hospital. We give praise for that. Um, she has some doctor's appointments coming up to lift up those appointments. The Riggleman son-in-law is doing much better. Another praise is the United Women in Faith, formerly UMW, raised over $700 yesterday. Yes, you can give a clap for that. At the Belch Charity Day Sale, it continues today. Those are wonderful praises. Some concern is for the family of Ron Counterman. His, again, his service will be Saturday here at 4 p.m. And just a little brief summary of his life that Jean handed me before the service. He was born in Pennsylvania and entered into eternal rest on October 12th of this year. He was a retired Sergeant First Class for the United States Army, a member of the Zephyr Hills Moose Club Lodge 2276, Mulberry American Legion Post 72, and the Lions Club in New York. He was a loving husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, and enjoyed collecting eagles. He is survived by his wife, Jean, several children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, by his brother, Raymond, brother-in-law. Services, again, will be Saturday at 4 p.m. We are also lifting up the family of Ron Sunderhouse. His service will be, I have that. The 23rd at 11. The 23rd, the 11 at... Uh, at the Church of God. Thank you. I have that written down somewhere else. We're going to continue to pray for Rena's family. And again, we're going to continue to pray for repairs for the church that Joyce just shared. These joys, these concerns, we come together. If you are someone watching online and have a joy or a concern, feel free to email the church office so we are aware. But I invite you to join me in prayer where we will first begin with some silence so you can lift up a prayer to God, perhaps just to sit. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, on this day of remembrance, we gather before you with hearts full of gratitude and awe. We thank you for the brave men and women who have served our nation, those who have given their time, their strength, and sometimes their very lives to defend the values of freedom and justice we hold dear. We thank you for the sacrifices of our veterans. We keep them lifted up in prayer, asking that they feel your peace surrounding them. Lord, we pray for those who are serving today, both near and far, that they may be strengthened by your presence and find peace amid the challenges they face. May we honor them not just with our words, but with our actions, by working to create a world, a peace of a compassion and understanding, where no one is forgotten or left on the margins. Lord, we remember the words that we heard in the Gospel of Mark about the dangers of pride and self-righteousness, the deep value of humility and generosity. Lord, we confess that we have not always been drawn to the poor, the outcast. It can be easy to be drawn to the outward opinion. May we, like the widow, offer all we have. Lord, as your church, we are called to live generously with our time, our talents, and love. We are in a world that desperately needs to see your light. Let us remember the true measure of our faith is not the size of our donations or outward signs of success, but in the depths of our devotion, 
our willingness to sacrifice, and on our commitment to justice and mercy for all. Lord, we lift up those names that were shared earlier. We celebrate the praises of recovering from being in the hospital, of upcoming doctor's appointments. Lord, we lift up our church family, those who are hurting of losing loved ones. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling. We pray for those who are feeling marginalized, forgotten, those who are struggling. May they know the comforting embrace of your love. Lord, we as your church are seeking to be a light in the darkness, a place of refuge and hope. Help us to remember that the work of your kingdom is how we serve others, how we care for those in need, and how we be better advocates. We pray for wisdom and courage. We pray for our church. And Lord, when we pray, we can pray together the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 110. Red handle is stand as they Martin Luther King.
church, let us go in peace and love and let us be the light and the love to those on the margins. Go in peace and love. Amen.